Hi, guys. Welcome to Universe View Odyssey channel. De Broly's Matter Wave and Supporting Evidence. With the wave particle duality of light becoming realistically undeniable, many physicists have begun to believe that this apparent reciprocal contradiction is an essential property of atomic physics. Furthermore, they came to think strangely, if the light that we thought was certain to wave has particle nature, would there be no law that electrons that are clear to be particles should not have wave nature? Louis de Broglie, a French aristocratic physicist, attempted a groundbreaking idea in 1924 to extend the wave-particle duality of light to the electrons, the basic particles of matter. He proposed the matter-wave hypothesis that all matter including electrons have wave properties. De Broglie applied the relationship between the momentum and the wavelength of the photon to the electron in Einstein's light quantum hypothesis to obtain the wavelength of the electron, and then obtained the wavelength of other materials from this equation. He named the wave, matter wave. Let's take a look at the logical process by which de Broglie conceived the matter wave. De Broglie was inspired by Einstein's energy mass equivalent formula for special relativity. Combining the relationship between wave frequencies and energy in Planck's energy quantum hypothesis and Einstein's light quantum hypothesis under the E equals mc formula leads to a new conclusion that mass has wave properties. De Broglie's brother Maurice de Broglie, an experimental physicist, seems to have had a considerable impact on de Broglie's idea of matter wave. Deeply impressed by Einstein's light quantum at the first Solvay conference in 1911, Morris conducted many X-ray experiments, reminding his younger brother Louis J that X-rays are sometimes waves and sometimes particles. De Broglie, who heard this, began to examine it mathematically, saying, if light, which is a wave, has particle properties, how can electrons, which are particles, not have wave properties? In other words, it attempted a groundbreaking idea to extend the wave-particle duality of light to electrons, which are the basic particles of matter. Einstein read de Broglie's paper from his friend Paul Langevin, a French physicist. De Broglie's advisor, Langevin, was curious about what Einstein would think. It's no wonder that Einstein praised de Broglie's idea. It was a result naturally derived from the theory of relativity and the light quantum hypothesis that he invented. Einstein delivered the paper to his friend Max Born and said, read it. It sounds crazy, but it's an absolutely solid theory. Einstein then evaluated Langevin, saying, de Broglie removed one of the huge bales. In any case, de Broglie excellently explained the basis of Bohr's quantum conditions, especially through the concept of matter waves. Bohr's quantum hypothesis and quantum conditions explained the radiation phenomenon of atoms, but failed to explain why electrons should be in a particular orbit. However, de Broglie explained this by suggesting that Bohr's quantum hypothesis should be understood as a description of the matter wave. Waves around the nucleus must always be at rest for geometrical reasons. In other words, it must exist at an integer multiple of the wavelength around the orbit. Electrons do not orbit around the atomic nucleus, but exist in a state straddled around the atomic nucleus to maintain a normal state because the electrons themselves are waves.
In this way, the source of Bohr's quantum condition, which seemed to be somewhat frustrating, was revealed, and quantum theory took a new phase that was later established as Schrodinger's wave mechanics. De Broglie was awarded the Nobel Prize in Physics in 1929 for his role in laying the mathematical foundation for quantum mechanics. Now, let's apply de Broglie's wave of matter to Bohr's atomic model. Unlike particles, waves do not exist in a particular location, but span a certain range. Therefore, electrons around an atom exist in an unfolded state around the nucleus as an electromagnetic wave. Moreover, if the wavelength fails to form a closed curve around the atom, it disappears. Assuming that the electromagnetic wave is around the atomic nucleus, the floor and floor of the wave disappear by the interference principle if the valley and valley do not overlap. This means that the floor of the electromagnetic wave must be integer around the nucleus, that is, the length of the electromagnetic wave is integer times the wavelength. This is another expression of Bohr's quantum condition. Bohr failed to explain the reason for the quantum condition, but de Broglie solved the reason for Bohr's quantum condition with the concept of matter waves. In other words, the strange condition of quantum conditions attached to the orbit of electrons is due to the fact that electrons are waves. In classical physics, there was no way to explain the quantum conditions because electrons were considered only particles. De Broglie's matter wave hypothesis served as an excellent bridge to connect waves and particles from quantum conditions that were opaque in this way. Meanwhile, no experimental results have been published until then to prove that particles have a wave nature. Then, by Clinton Davidson and Lester Germa in the United States, this surprising hypothesis was eventually proved to be true. Davidson was a scientist at the Bell Telephone Institute at the time. He went on vacation to England in the summer of 1926 and attended an academic conference of the British Society for the Promotion of Science in Oxford, where he learned de Broglie's theory of matter waves and Schrödinger's wave mechanics through Max Born's lecture. Inspired by Born's lecture, he decided to reenact the rudimentary experiment on electronic scattering, which he had already attempted in 1923. In March 1927, Davidson and Germer succeeded in experimenting with the de Broglie matter wave by squeezing an electron beam onto the surface of nickel metal. George Paget Thompson, a professor of natural philosophy at the University of Aberdeen in Scotland, was interested in Bourne's lecture after attending a conference of the British Society for the Advancement of Science in 1926. In November 1927, Thompson successfully fired cathode ray beams at solid targets such as aluminum, gold, and celluloid to capture the diffraction of electrons on a photographic dry plate. Davidson and Thompson's experiments gave clear experimental evidence for de Broglie's matter wave theory and Schrödinger's wave mechanics. Their experiment was conducted in a similar manner to the double-slit experiment mentioned earlier. Among the numerous electrons fired toward the slit, the electrons that luckily passed through the slit reached the phosphorescent screen behind it, leaving small dots as traces. However, Davidson and Germa found something surprising in the experiment. An interference pattern appeared on the screen. This was a truly remarkable discovery that proved de Broglie's hypothesis that a particle of electrons had wave properties. 
their screens were regularly arranged with black areas where no electrons had reached. Even if the amount of electrons emitted was drastically reduced and sent out one every 10 seconds, an interference pattern was still formed on the screen. As a result, it is inevitable to accept that individual electrons, like photons, cause interference with themselves. In other words, particles have wave properties. After Davidson and Germer's experiment, similar experiments such as neutron and atomic interference tests succeeded one after another, forcing physicists to admit a rather absurd hypothesis that all materials, particles, have wave properties. However, the solid materials of the real world we are experiencing, such as cars and buildings, have no resemblance to waves no matter how much we look at them. You may think like this. Isn't it possible to act like a wave because the size of the electron is so small? What's the big deal about that? Is that really true? In 1985, Professor Anton Zeilinger, who won the Nobel Prize in Physics 2022, of the Institute of Experimental Physics at the University of Vienna, a Swiss experimental physicist, successfully tested the interference of a fulleran molecule. The simplest fullerene molecule is a soccer ball shape, with 60 carbon atoms combined in a pentagon and hexagon shape. Its mass is about 1 million times that of an electron. The scientific community predicts that if experimental technology develops in the future, it will be possible to observe larger molecular interference. Therefore, it is clear that the wave properties and interference of particles are not limited to basic particles like electrons. And this world is ultimately made up of micro-worlds. What is the boundary between the micro-world and the real world? De Broglie argued that all matter have wave properties, and their wavelengths are proportional to the Planck constant. To be more precise, the wavelength of a wave of matter is the Planck constant divided by the momentum of the object. However, because the Planck constant is a constant that is too small, and materials of everyday size have a very large momentum, the wavelength of the material wave was so small that it could not be observed. This is also the reason why the wave properties of materials appear prominently on the microscopic scale. If the momentum of an object decreases to a level similar to the Planck constant, the wavelength of the material wave increases relatively. It is just that the wave nature of everyday materials was not detected in our eyes because the Planck constant is such a small value as the speed of light is so fast that the reality of space-time has been obscured for many years. Davidson and G.P. Thomson were awarded the 1937 Nobel Prize in Physics for their experiments confirming the wave nature of electrons. G.P. Thomson is the son of Joseph John Thomson, who won the 1906 Nobel Prize for discovering the former. Thanks for watching.